My guest today is Jim Woolley. Jim, how are you? Very good. Long time to see. Uh, it's been no. about a year. Been about a year. Uh, almost yeah. exactly a year in this city. I think we in Chicago when we did the last one, yes. <laughs> exactly. Uh, what's, um, what's new? Oh, there's always something new, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, tell me yeah. what you spoke about here at VS Live. Okay, well, I did uh, actually have four talks today. Or wow. th not today, but at VS Live. So uh, earlier today, I did what's new in Entity Framework 3, uh -huh. uh, a quick chat in SignalR. Uh, sort of an interesting pun there. Uh, and then tomorrow I'm doing a session on Indie Framework Performance Tuning and also with C Sharp 8 and Roslyn. So That's I think last lot. time we, we were together we did the, we talked about Roslyn. We talked about right? Roslyn, yeah. which is still, it's still going strong. Yeah. And um, let's talk about Entity Framework. Okay. So Entity Framework sounds good. That sort so of goes back to our old days, doesn't it? You were the link king. You were the data. You've always been the data guy. I think yeah. you still are. But that was uh, you were mm -hmm. you were the king then. Yeah, yeah the link. <laughs> my, the, my Twitter alias the, I think was Americas. actually Link kink, kink at that point. Yes. Kink. Kink. Yes. Oh, <laughs> With the Q at the I end. I must have a, been yeah. uh, reading it wrong. <laughs> yeah. Um, now you're the emeritus. Yeah, we'll, we'll go with that. Well, Link sort of expanded a lot uh, it since is, yeah. then. You know? And at, at that point, uh, we had Link to SQL, but Entity Framework was still not shipped, I don't believe. Oh, was so that what it was? Yeah. yeah we're, going, we're going back to 2008, I believe, at this point. It was in uh, Tennessee, and I think Knoxville, Tennessee, is yep. my, if memory serves me. So. Um, and uh, so Entity Framework, so that was even, was that really pre-Entity Framework when we first spoke? It could have been, or right about when it was shipping right at that point. Right about when yeah. version 1 came so, out. Yeah. Because uh, version 1 came out with uh, 3.5 Service Pack 1 okay. for Entity Framework. So yeah, it's been a while, and we've learned a lot since then, haven't yeah, we? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I know I have. Yeah. <laughs> what's, uh, <laughs> Hopefully tell, we me, have. tell me about EF. What's going on with EF? Uh, well, EF, uh, Entity, the core, framework. Yeah, Entity Framework, the core focus obviously is on core, as most everything else is .NET in .NET core. regarding. Uh, they did actually, as part of .NET Core 3, uh, add a support for Entity Framework 6.3. So the full Entity Framework is compared to just the Entity Framework core. Uh, so if people are on legacy applications that want to leverage that, then they can you know, stay on 6.3 if By they wanted to. By legacy, you mean non.NET Core. Yeah. Uh, .NET Framework applications. Yes. All right. Um, you know, so you know, code bases that have been around for a little while that have uh, a lot of things built up. Like there are certain features in, in core, for example, that aren't supported yet in uh, that aren't supported in core yet. Uh, one of the big ones that people often run into is many to many without the mm -hmm. join table, right? And okay. so Entity Framework uh, all, all along from one through six had the ability to exclude the join table in mm -hmm. the model. So we have you know, uh, customers and orders where a customer can have orders and order have, you know, have customers. Right. Where in the database you needed a customer order table, let's say. Yeah, and that right? was really just to compensate for a limitation of most relational databases, right. SQL included. Right, and, and so with Entity Framework, you can have that object mapping uh, to be able to eliminate that. With Core, at this point still, they don't have the ability to do it without that, so you have to include the join table as part of your, as your entity you itself. Entity for that. Okay. Uh, so you do need an entity on that one still, which means that you can't just take your existing en uh, objects and uh, just copy them and use them in your core or just upgrade your core projects and go ahead and say I'm, I'm using Entity Framework core uh, because there are certain constructs which aren't necessarily allowed, but there's some additional features as well um, that are included in within core as well. So, okay. um, But you know, what I've been focusing probably more on is uh, performance issues and yeah. you know how to how to help customers when they're dealing with performance issues, not just to throw the baby out with the bathwater to say, you know, well, this one query doesn't work very well, so Therefore, I'm going to get rid of everything. No good. Right. <laughs> That's, uh, um, you know, what, what are ways that we can do to help to improve our performance and, and pay oh, attention yeah. and to it? It might be helpful things. if you just describe what the problem that Entity Framework solves. Sure. Well, Entity Framework is an abstraction over the relational data, right? Okay. And so it allows you to access your data in more like a query kind of syntax, and you don't have to worry about the plumbing of how do I ac access the database and, you know, and, and some of those kinds of things. You can even do code first where you're just writing your code and then scaffolding the database off of that. I typically use a database project to okay. separate those out, but you, you have the ability to you know, have that little more flexibility. Okay. You start and thinking about your database uh, as objects, as, as yeah. .NET objects. Right. Um, and then, so you have the ability to have objects, object graphs, potentially. Uh, some of that's not fully supported in core yet. 
Um, but then it's all fully type safe, so that you're, you know, just as you have with Link, you know, you have IntelliSense over it, and you have yep. the yeah, type safety time and the compile time checking and, and those kinds of things. Although with compile time checking, if you're if you change the data type of an object, let's say you have a, a GUID that you're storing in the database as a string, mm -hmm. and you, you know, the, your type conversions don't necessarily match, right. it'll still compile on both sides. You, you, you would get a runtime exception at that point. But. A string fish to a GUID, it right. might not work. Right, <laughs> so, but you know, it's, it's trying to guide you in the right way. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's, that's sort of what entity framework, it's an object relational mapper in, the, in that okay. regard, yeah. All right, and so that, I mean, that's, that's great for uh, speed of development, it's great for the, being able to think about your model in terms of real objects, uh, but it adds overhead. It, it can add some overhead, and it, and it can also do things, if you're not paying attention, uh -huh. it can do some really bad things too, hmm. right? And so, I mean, the biggest thing that I find with customers is when they're having problems is that they're just not paying attention. And I'm not, sorry, I wasn't, not monitoring. I wasn't listening. Yeah, there you go. Uh, so watch what's going on to your database, when it's happening to your database, and okay. being able to, because while with Entity Framework you don't need to necessarily learn SQL, uh -huh. if you want to build performing applications, you, you need to understand what the SQL is and, and why it's important as oh, that's well. A, that's a key point. Right. So uh, the knowing knowing the SQL is being generated mm -hmm. is uh, really helpful Yeah, being a good EF developer. Yeah, and it's, I mean, in any framework or any of these tools aren't going to optimize your indexes for you automatically necessarily, okay. right? Now, Azure does that actually fairly well. Azure, a Azure, Azure SQL, SQL database? Yes. I did not know that. Yes, it, it has a feature where you can turn it on and it just says, I'll go ahead and generate your index generate for you. It'll generate indexes on the fly. Um, based, based, off off of your, you know, based, based off of the queries that it's yeah. executing. And it can see, well, that actually, it, it improved this one, but it had a degradation on this one. I'm going to roll that back. And it can oh, do all of that even, automatically, too. Indexes yeah. Yeah, um, you, know, you, you have to be careful what you do with some of those sure. kinds of things, obviously. Um, but you, you do need to you know, have indexing and, and leveraging index, indexing and those kinds of things. Um, in order to be successful at all. But you also need to be paying attention to what your queries are doing. Are they actually using the indexes or are they just ignoring them altogether? Right. And uh, you know, so the ability to pay attention to those. But the, the biggest thing I find is when people are lazy loading and don't realize it. Oh yeah. So lazy loading, if you're not familiar, is when I, let's say we have a customer in orders, mm -hmm. and I, access, you know, I have uh, five customers that I'm wanting to iterate over, and I get the first customer, and then I do dot orders. Mm -hmm. Well, if you're doing lazy loading, that's going to get dot orders from the database. Okay. And so we do f you know, five customers, and each one of those is also, we have one query to get the five customers, and then five more queries to get each one of those uh, set of orders as well. Right. And if we start cascading that down multiple levels, then we get to have some problems. Yeah. Well, sometimes that's an advantage. It, it can be an advantage uh, where you, you you're know, not getting things that you don't need. Yeah. You maybe you, need you, you never get down to that that fourth customer. Sure. Loading them. But if you're going through all of them, it might make more sense to grab them all up front. Right. You know, you're paying attention to what you're doing. I, I had one customer that I found a nested looping four levels deep, mm -hmm. and then in that fourth level they were making about five logging requests. Hmm. Each one of those was calling first on a collection. So when they were calling first inside the collection, that's hitting the database. Oh, okay. To, it was like customer first where ID equals this, dot first name. Customer first where ID equals this, dot last name. Hmm. And five of those. Okay. Okay, so that's so five I requests to the database, four levels nested deep, right? I see. Every single time I got to that, which I got to many, you know, by uh, power of mm -hmm. four or whatever that is. And where do you think they were logging this information to? Database? Yes. I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> so that doubled it, right? So there. that doubled it, yeah. right there. <laughs> and all they were doing was logging. They weren't actually doing any business logic at all. So they didn't need any of it. Oh. <laughs> so <laughs> but just they just weren't paying attention control to Control, delete, thing. solve the problem. Right. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, if I were to be paid by the number of lines of code I've written, I'd owe a lot of money over my days because I've removed <laughs> a lot of code over time. <laughs> yeah. um, but it, you know, the, the key there is pay attention. There's numbers of profiling tools out there that you can leverage. Some yeah, of them free and others. How, how, what's yeah. the best way to understand what's going on? 
I mean, I in a framework. Yeah, my my uh, old standby is probably SQL Profiler. Okay. Because uh, I use mostly SQL databases and, uh, under the covers. So you can and turn so that on and just look at SQL Server, and it'll show you on the server side. Yes. Yeah. What's, what's it, happening? It, it'll show me every time a SQL statement gets issued to the database mm -hmm. what that SQL statement was. Mm -hmm. The downside is it doesn't allow me to tie that back to the line of code that happened on. I see. Okay. Right. So I have to be paying attention and like step debugging in right. to, to be able to notice it. But you know, if you have the profile and you see well, I'm hitting the a customer table 20 times. And I, I know that's only one line of code, one mm -hmm. line of entity framework code. Yeah. Then there's probably some lazy then code. There's code. probably some optimization. And there are a lot, a lot of ways that you can make those optimizations. Mm. Um, you know, but some, somewhere they'd be paying attention to at that point. So um, and you, you can use that, or you can hook you know, logging implementations in, and uh, Core and full.net both support uh, logging at this point. Will it log the generated SQL? Yes, and that's um, what that logging is, is doing, is logging okay. the generated. Now, there's actually a, by default, it's not gonna log the parameters, Okay. Because those could be sensitive information, it could be PII, for example, in those parameters. Okay. Uh, so it's going to log the rest of the statement, but not the parameter values. Okay. Um, there actually is a way in core to, to say, yes, I want the sensitive information as well. A configuration change? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, um, but you probably don't want to turn that on unless you're really having problems, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, so you can you can do logging. Uh, there are other if you're using uh, enter, um, Visual, Full Visual Studio uh, that has the diagnostic tools. Mm -hmm. And one of the nice things about that is I can just uh, when I, I can see each one of the SQL statements, and you can also filter down to only see the ADO statements, for example. Oh, nice. Uh, and then I can see all the SQL statements, and then if I double click on one of those, it'll take me to the line of code that actually was responsible from that you know, that call. Mm -hmm. So that that's an easier way of tying back. Okay. Um, so now you've got a tool that's running on, such on a client that, that you right. just described there, and SQL Profiler running on the server, mm -hmm. and you can sort of compare those two. Yeah, I mean, it, it can also hook into, um, if you want to use um, App Insights, uh -huh. you, you can uh, hook into App Insights for some of the monitors as well. Again, don't include the parameterized values there. Right. Um, there's also third-party uh, tools. Um, some of the guys who did uh, and, and Hibernate have oh, yeah. uh, EFProf. Those, those, and, uh, what, there's some Rhino something or other? Yeah, yeah. I forgot what they call them. Uh, <laughs> there's EFProf, there's um, Mini Profiler, uh, and there's a couple of other ones out there, which some of them are pay um, mm -hmm. products. So I, I typically in, in events try to show the free stuff. Sure. As much as possible. Let's start with the free. Yeah. And, and then if yeah. it doesn't, when you hit a wall, then mm -hmm. then open your wallet. Yeah. But, but some of these will, will give you a little bit more insight, which sure. is beneficial. And, and if, I mean, you may only pay 200 bucks for a license on one of these things. And yeah. the amount of time you would have to spend otherwise trying to find something and, and would have probably easily paid for it as well. Right. Especially at your rates. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's less than an hour. Maybe. <laughs> I, not that I get paid that fully. But. Uh, excellent. Anything else? Ah, there's always something else, oh, right? something. But uh, maybe we'll cover that for next year when we're together. That's a good idea. Yeah. Jim, thanks so much. Oh, you're welcome. Hey, friends. This is the Link Kink here uh, telling everybody to... Uh, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater when using Entity Framework as a technology source. Uh, learn how to make it performant, and we'll talk to you about that. Thanks. <laughs>